chapter 16. The word of God says, without a vision, the people perish. Or it could be said in other terms, the people cast off restraint. One uh, translation says that means the people become undisciplined. And another translation says, without a vision, the people wander. And so by those two phrases, we see how important it is to have a vision, to have vision for our lives. Uh, what is God doing? What is the Christian life all about? And uh, there are many uh, passages in the Bible that give us vision. Uh, and this is one of them. Ezekiel chapter 16 is one of them that uh, reviews the, the history of Israel, but at, it is in such terms here that we know that uh, the writer, which is the Holy Spirit, was looking ahead to the time of, of the New Testament, the time of grace and spirit. And so uh, let's, let's look at it, and I want us to, to read... Uh, we need to read um, the first 14 verses of this so that we can get the whole picture and then we'll comment about it. Uh, and observe the terms, and I hope that you'll agree with me. As we read this, you'll find that these terms are very unusual. Uh, this must be more than just a story of, of Israel's uh, history. Uh, the terms are... Are, are metaphors, and they are, they are such that they apply to more than just an historical account. And so I want you to pick that up as we read this, and we'll, we'll comment on about those later. Now, of course, it is a, a, uh, a, an account of Israel's history and the way of the Lord with them. And in that regard, brothers and sisters, I want to say that the history of Israel was a blueprint for us. It shows us our walk with the Lord. It shows us the pathway of the Lord for us. It shows us how God deals with us. And uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I'd like to know, uh, you know, where have we been? What has God done in my life? And, you know, the Word of God is, is, is so wonderful that it also, it not only points to the future, but it also helps to explain what has happened to you in the past. Uh, you know, what's it all about? What, what, what happened to me? What has God been doing? And where are we heading? I like that. I like to know what God's been doing in the past, and I like to know a little bit about the future. And so that's the overall all thing then becomes the vision of the Lord. Uh, reading in Ezekiel 16. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And as for thy nativity in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut. Neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood. I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou wast, hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, 
And I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God. And thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee. And I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck. And I'm sure as we're reading, you see how the unusual kind of terms that are being used here uh, for the work of the Lord uh, to his people. Verse 12, I, And I put a jewel in thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thou, wa, thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown, or thy glory, went forth among the heathen, and thy beauty, for it was perfect, through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. I believe that there's an application here to all of our lives and also to the church in general uh, of how the Lord works with us and uh, what his goals are for our lives. Uh, we see here how that God came to the rescue of this new nation called Israel. When all the others had been uh, in existence for a long period of time, and uh, here comes this, as it were, this new, new kid on the block, we often say, and... Uh, the Bible here speaks of the day of her nativity, or the day when she was born. And uh, the picture is that uh, in the day of, of her birth, no one had compassion upon her. No one paid attention. No one had pity. No one took care of her. And she is likened here unto a newborn baby. And we understand that quite often a newborn baby is covered with blood. And the first one of the first things that has to be done at the time of birth is to thoroughly wash the baby of its blood. And that's the picture here. It has the, the picture has to do with the day of birth when the baby, the new baby, is covered with its own blood. Well, the Bible says the life is in the blood. And when you and I are first born into this world, yes, we do have a life. We have a form of existence. But it's something that we would call our own life. Something really foreign to the kingdom of God. We are all born in sin. We are all born with the Adamic nature. And so that that life is not really the life that God has meant for us to have. And for those of you who uh, can identify, you know how that uh, for a period of, of time that you went from the time of your birth, and you continued in this life, we could say that the blood of your life remained upon you. 
And it was so inspiring a couple of weeks ago to hear our brother David Diefenbach's testimony of the degradation that his life uh, manifests and uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the gutter type of existence that he was thrust into, the streets of the city and, and uh, the drug scene and all of that. And, and the old life, the old Adamic life uh, uh, just pretty much pervading and uh, manifesting. And, and for all of us, it was like that. In one way or another, the old life was expressed, manifest uh, in various ways, uh, not to the glory of God, far from that which God had intended for any of us. Folks, we were all born into sin. And as it were, even though we had parents, even though we had teachers, we went to school and uh, there was some kind of an input attempted, yet with all of that, nobody really cared for us like the Lord. Amen? Nobody cared for you like the Lord Jesus. Because no matter the input they made, your parents, your teachers, your family, whatever, no matter the input that, that they made, nobody could give you the life like Jesus. There is a life that is different from the natural life, the old Adamic life, the life of sin. It is the life that Jesus Christ came to give us through his death on the cross. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so this is the picture here. With respect to the real life and the real care and the real love, God says, nobody pitied you. Nobody had compassion on you. Nobody really cared for you in the true and ultimate sense of the word. Regardless of what was done to you, you still remain like a baby just uh, born into this world and left there with all its blood dripping from it. Nobody washing you. Nobody paying any attention to you. Nobody caring. We used to sing a song, nobody cared for me like Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you and I were left to ourselves. There, as it were, on the, the birth table, the birthing table, with no one to pay any attention to us, with no one to care for this newborn child. But, oh, praise God, there is one who has loved us and cared for us. And in verse 6, it says, And when I passed by thee, hallelujah, when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted, in your own blood. I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. And I thank God for the, the time and the hour when the Lord passed by me. When he saw me, it was a young age, eight years of age, but he saw the direction that I could have headed. He saw you when you were in your own blood, in your own life. He saw you doing your own thing, out in sin. The Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sin. But by grace you are saved. By faith in the Lord Jesus, we've come to know a new life. Hallelujah. And when the Lord God passes by, and it is his doing, folks, I repeat this over and over again. Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And there came that hour when David Diefenbach was apprehended. <laughs> Hallelujah. There came that hour when George Stein was apprehended. And every one of you, praise God, it was an hour when the Lord passed by your life and he had one intention, a loving, caring intention. He loved you. The psalmist said in Psalm 142, no man cared for my soul. In my distress, I cried and I cried and, and uh, 
Uh, I had, my troubles were, were, were uh, I was drowning in my troubles and nobody cared for my soul until the Lord heard my cry. Folks, he cares for your soul today. Amen. He loves you. He loves me. Think of a God who came by. He came by and laid his hand on you and said in so many words, follow me. And those words meant something. Those words meant that you were apprehended for a new lifestyle, an altogether new life to be lived for his name and for his glory. I'm saying this today because I appreciate my salvation. I appreciate that I am in the kingdom of God and that Jesus Christ loved me and chose me and he passed by my life. I'll never forget the time when my mother at the altar called and she just grabbed my hand. She said, come on, we're going to go. And we went to the altar to give our lives to the Lord Jesus. And so that's how it starts. A new life, and it is Christ Jesus that gives us the new life. He is the author of life. Nicodemus wondered about who he was. And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And by the new birth and by the receiving of a new life, you may enter into the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you can't enter. It's only by receiving this new life that you enter. And thank God that Israel was given life through Father Abraham and all that ensued. And they were made a people of God's purpose. And that's how it is with you and me, brothers and sisters. When you and I got saved, we became a people of purpose. Up until that, we, we would go through our paces. Some of you were saved at a later age than I was. And you were going through your paces, eating, drinking, going to work, going through the paces of the natural life. But that is not real living. That is not life as the Bible defines life. Jesus says, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And it is with the coming of Jesus into our life that our life takes on an altogether different meaning. Life is now depicted as something more than just eating, drinking, working, making money, and establishing an earthly living. Life is far greater than all of that. Life means that you're now attached to a purpose. And with our conversion and with our apprehension by the Lord Jesus, we begin a wonderful and glorious new life. Verse 7 says, I cause you to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great and thou art come to excellent ornaments. And, and thy breasts were fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. And in verse 7, we see that there is a progress of growth. In Israel, he said, or to Israel, he said, you began to multiply. And oh, how they did multiply and it increased, increased in the land of Egypt, even though the Egyptians were, were trying to stop it. Yet Israel multiplied, they increased over and over again until they were perhaps several million strong. Growth and increase. Ours is a spiritual one. After our conversion, God means for us to grow spiritually. And we grow by taking in the milk of the word. Just like a baby takes in the milk, of, uh, the natural milk to grow and to develop. So it is with you and me. We need the word of the Lord. We need to read our Bibles. We need to come to church and hear the word of God so that we might grow and have our spiritual life become strong 
and established. Then in verse 8, we have something else. The Lord says, Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord, and thou becamest mine. And this speaks to me about our personal relationship with the Lord. Oh, sure, when we're saved, we know a great deliverance. We know that God has saved us out of a life of sin and, and degradation. But you know, it takes a period of time to really come to know him and to establish a love relationship. And that's what verse 8 talks about, a love relationship. And you realize that there is something personal between you and the Lord. You are special to him. And he makes a personal covenant with you. That means there is a special purpose for your life in his economy. You are not just one of many that, you know, well, we're all of just millions all over the world. We're one of many that he looks upon. No, you are very special. He pays very careful attention to your life. He has a very unique and special purpose for you. That purpose is only for you. There is something for you that is for nobody else. Our God, this is, this is awesome, our God when you consider the millions of people across the world and the millions that are in the body of Christ, our God has a personal relationship with each of us and a personal purpose or covenant with us that is to be established and become fulfilled through our lifetime. Think of that. So that now, instead of you being just one of billions that are out there trying to eke out a natural living, trying to survive naturally, working, eating, sleeping, exercising, natural living, natural living. Instead of just going about that type of lifestyle, you are now involved in a unique, glorious spiritual purpose, a personal covenant. I made a covenant with you, just as he did with Abraham. He said to Abraham, in blessing, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And through you and your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That was his personal covenant. And I want you to realize today, folks, that every one of you have a personal covenant. In the sense that there's a specific purpose for your life. There are works that God has ordained for you to do for him, which, which were ordained from before the foundation of the world. I think I would like to read that for you out of Ephesians. Here's what it says out of Ephesians. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, he hath quickened us, that is, made us alive made us alive, given us new life, something inside. You must be born again. How can I be born again, Nicodemus said. Can I enter again into my mother's room? No, it's not that. It's the impartation of a new life in the spirit, deep in the heart of man. Something that vibrates, something that is, that is a, a, a quickening factor in our lives. You're aware of something new in there. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. By grace are you saved and hath raised us up together. You see, we're all in an all, altogether different dimension than the dimension of the earthlies. The majority of folks on the face of the earth are dwelling just in an earthly dimension. But we're not of the earth, earthly. We're of, of the heavens. So he quickened us together with him and raised us up together. 
May that become a reality today, folks. The raising up together to dwell in heavenly places. That in the ages to come, he might show forth the ex exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained or prepared that we should walk in them. You know what I believe? And that scripture supports it. I believe that we are to, to live and walk just like Jesus walked and lived. And here's how he walked and lived. That every night he prayed, and every morning he went out. He went out and walked to fulfill the revelation of the will of God for that day. And when that, that day was completed, he accomplished a certain portion of the Father's work, the work that he had called him to do. And the next night, the Bible says he went out to the Mount of Olives, or he went to some... Uh, remote place by himself. And again he prayed. And I believe that it was then that the Father God showed him. For example, on one occasion he was praying all night and the next day he chose the twelve apostles. Each, in each day of Jesus' life there was a special work for him to do. And that's how it is in our lives. I believe that. In every day, there's special work for us to do. And, of course, it's incumbent upon us to seek his face and to know what God would have us to do. A personal covenant, a personal individual purpose. Your purpose is like nobody else's. Our nephew Bert yesterday was in a funeral home where 15 souls gave their heart to the Lord Jesus. Yesterday, I was at the King's Academy, praying, sharing a bit of the word. A few people told me they learned something new. <laughs> that was my work for yesterday. Other things. What was your work for yesterday? What's your work for today? God has something specific and special for today, tomorrow, the next day, the next week. Of course, our jobs have to be incorporated in this. That's the will of God for you. If a man doesn't work, he's not going to eat either, the Bible says. But other than that, and apart from that, in addition to that, we need to ever be, we need to ever be aware of that voice on the inside, and we never ever need to, ever need to ask, Lord, what would you have me to do? Um, Friday night, I've lost track of time. Friday night, I was in to see Bob, and I was walking out. And just as I reached the doors of the hospital, here's a, a young girl being brought in on a wheelchair, and she's crying and yelling out, screaming vehemently. And, and just at the same time, falling off to sleep and waking up, and somebody was there uh, uh, doing this to her, and wake up, wake up, stay awake, stay awake, Lila. And she'd scream and yell, and then she'd go back and fall asleep. And they were trying to keep her awake. And I was wondering, what is all this going on? And the Lord, the Lord seemed to imply to me, you've got to hang around a while. <laughs> so I went over and I uh, just stood by there. And the two of the attendants uh, from the ambulance were there. And they kept looking over at me. And they, were, <laughs> and they said, uh, after a while, they said, who are you? I said, well, I'm a pastor. I said, I'm waiting to see what's going to happen here. I'm, I might be praying for somebody. <laughs> and here was um, a young girl that was standing right by the wheelchair, and she was distraught. And the Lord pointed her out to me and said, she's the one. And uh, I prayed with her. What's your name? My name's Jill. I said, let me pray for you. And she said, oh, would you? <laughs> 
People are waiting, folks. People are waiting. They're, people are in need all over the place. And as I broke, she, as I prayed, she broke down and cried. And then I felt there was an impartation of God's love to her. Wonderful. And uh, from there, it was just a start. I looked over, and then the next thing I saw was uh, parents had brought a little boy, and he was holding his head. They were holding his head with a cloth, and he was crying, and and I went over, I said, what's going on here? And, <laughs> and a, a mission field there in the hospital. <laughs> and uh, uh, they said, he fell down, uh, down in the, from the bleachers at the football game. And I remember the night when David fell at uh, the Reading, foot, uh, Reading baseball one time, uh, all the way from the top row. And he hit... Some of the crossbars on the way down, that was uh, really scary. But here was this little boy, a big, big, big gash, and he was crying. And I went over, I felt to pray. Carter, I said, I want you to know you, everything's going to be all right. The Lord's going to take care of you. And the parents said, oh, thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And it went on. Here's another guy over in a wheelchair, and I felt led to go over to him and and I said, uh, sir, what is the matter with you? <laughs> you know, once you get rolling, you, you realize <laughs> you don't want to stop. <laughs> and here's a guy, George will appreciate this. He had been driving truck for four days and, and had only three or four hours sleep in four days. And I said, brother, I said, that's not good. And he says, I know it. He says, my legs are all paralyzed. He says, I can't even walk anymore. And they had him in a wheelchair. And so I, <laughs> I lectured him. <laughs> I lectured him and I prayed for him <laughs> as well. But I mean to say, you know, for all of us folks, every day counts. Uh, there's a little saying that we used to hear years ago. You don't hear it so much anymore. It's very, very simple, but listen to this. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Isn't that good? Only one life. All the, you know, all the natural will pass away, but only the spiritual only the spiritual impartation, the blessings that we've given out, the words of the Lord that we've given out, acts of love and kindness, only that will last for all eternity. And so I want to encourage you today. I want you to see God's plan, the vision for you. He found you. He gave you life. And then he began to, to say, come into relationship with me. And we were teaching yesterday at the King's Academy from Isaiah chapter 40. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What does all that mean? And we shared with them these, these uh, little nuggets of truth. They that wait. The word wait is from a Hebrew root which means those whose lives are entwined with God shall renew their strength. The better word is exchange their strength. So here's the picture. We need to get into God's presence, get into prayer, read our Bibles, have times of devotion. And when we get there, when we're there, we need to wait before him. And the first thing the Lord showed me about this is this. Let go. Let go of all your plans. Let go of all your thinking all your worries, let go of everything. You see, they shall exchange their strength. And you let go of your plan, and God will give you his plan. You let go of your strength, and you're trying, and all of that, and say, oh, Lord, I just give it all up. I just turn it all over to you. That's just what the Lord wants. There's got to be that exchange first. As long as you're operating in your own your own strength. You've been trying to save your loved ones. You've been trying to do better at work. You've been this or that or the other. You've been trying, trying, trying. Maybe it's been in your own strength. 
They that wait upon the Lord shall exchange their strength. And as we're in God's presence, you know what happens? It's like, I think the proper word is osmosis. There's an impartation of all the virtues of God. I mean, not completely, but little by little, all that, uh, that he is, is imparted unto us in his presence. We take on his wisdom. We take on his love. We take on his compassion. We take on some of his knowledge. We receive grace. We could go on and on. During that time of our devotions, our time, the time when we're waiting upon the Lord, there's an exchange, even of your worries, your anxiety, uh, your determination. Oh, I'm going to go in there and you're going to get revenge about something. All of that is, you let go of that in the presence of God. When you're in the presence of the king, there's no more fight left in you. You're kind of emptied out. But there's an impartation. They that wait upon the Lord shall exchange their strength for his. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. As we wait upon the Lord in this personal relationship, we mount up in the Spirit. We get strong in the Spirit, and there's a literal ascension in the Spirit. We, re, we are restored to heavenly places, which is where we belong. That's where Christ took us in his resurrection. Folks, there's three things. There's not just the death of Jesus and not just the resurrection. There's also what? The ascension. We were raised together with him to dwell together with him in heavenly places. That's where our lives are destined to be lived. Not the earthlies. Not in our own strength. But in the heavens. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I just saw something new there for me anyway. And here's what I saw. They shall run. Running is, has to, to me, has to do with times of urgency. You better get there quick. 911. You better get there quick. They shall run and not be weary. An emergency is on hand. Uh, the prayer line, the prayer, prayer chain has been started. We go to prayer. They shall run to the cause. They shall be quick to respond. Run and not be weary. You'll find something of the life of Christ enables you to do the running. Those are the exceptional times in our life. But they shall walk and not faint. <laughs> that means every day. And the walking is much more than the running. You're called upon to walk. Every day of your life, walk with the Lord, walk in his presence, walk with the leading of the Spirit, walk, walk, walk. Do the, the, uh, the usual things that are expected of you. Go to work, care for your family, uh, think about others. All these things, walk. We can do that because of this relationship with the Lord. Quickly, verse 9 says, Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. Now, you know, why would the, why would the Holy Spirit use such terms if it were not that he wanted to point to something in the New Testament and in, in the experience of believers. I washed thee with water. When did, he, when did God ever wash Israel with water? And I anointed thee with oil. When did that ever happen? But the washing with water, folks, is this. It's the continual washing of our inner being by the water of God's word. The word of God is likened unto water which washes 
and cleanses. And way long after we're saved, there's stuff still sitting in there, uh, clung to us in there, things that have attached themselves to us that remain there from the old Adamic nature that need to be washed away by the washing of the word. And I believe, I do believe the word word there, now you've you got to listen to me. There's two words for word in the Greek. One of them is logos, that's the written word. The other one is rhema, that's the spoken word. When Jesus said, man cannot, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, that's the rhema. The word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's the word that God is speaking now. It's the spoken word. That's why you and I need to come to the house of God and expose ourselves to pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets and the servants of God who will teach us God's word. Oh, you need to read your Bible. Yes, but you also need to hear the spoken word. There's something about the preaching and teaching of God's word that impacts our inner being like nothing else. Jesus went about preaching and teaching and healing and delivering. And as we said last Friday night, we want the whole package. Preaching, teaching, healing, delivering. This is the gospel of the kingdom. And I anointed thee with oil. Our faculties, before we get saved and filled with the Spirit, are unequipped. We have no anointing from God. We're not able to seek properly. We're not able to understand properly. We do not know properly. We can't find our way through life properly without the anointing. We have no power without the anointing. You shall receive power, Jesus said, after the Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And we do believe in this church that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the second work that God has in our lives, that after we're saved, God has something else for us, the gift of the Holy Spirit. In that tremendous message of Peter on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 or more Jews were saved and brought into this new order called the kingdom of God, Peter had a word for them at the end. Because after Peter was done preaching on that day of Pentecost, it says when they heard it, they were pricked in their heart. In other words, they came under conviction. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, and here's the way of the Lord, not only for the Jews, but for all of us. Here's what he said. When they said, what shall we do? They said, he, they said, Peter and the apostles said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's baptism in water. And if any of you have committed to the Lord and haven't been baptized in water, we want to do that. We may not want to cut a hole through the ice, but we want to baptize you in water. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is like an anointing. It's an empowering. And once you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, all your faculties will be changed. They'll be empowered. You'll be anointed. You'll be able to see with the eye of the Spirit. Your hearing will be different. You won't hear just words and understand with a natural understanding. 
but you will hear spiritual things and you'll be able to interpret and understand by the Spirit. An altogether new order. You'll be able to touch and sense the presence of God once you have his presence inside of you. But there are those who teach this is only was only for the Jews. But I beg to differ with that because the next verse says this. Listen to it. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. That's the Gentiles. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How many of you would would believe that that covers everybody that's ever going to get saved. Would you accept that? As many as the Lord will call. This is for all of us to receive this experience that is talked about. I wash thee with water. That's an ongoing thing. I anointed thee with oil. And let's go on. And I clothe thee. I clothe thee. This is an ongoing process. The clothing. The putting on of Christian character, the development of character, uprightness, the righteousness of the saints in Revelation 12 is referred to as linen clothing. So clothing has to do with things like righteousness, uprightness, integrity, holiness, and things like that. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger's skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. Linen throughout the Bible has to do, and it's God's way of speaking, of the righteousness of God. Turn with me to Hebrews. Hold your hand in Ezekiel 12. I mean Ezekiel 16. And turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Here's what it says. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. And I'm I'm trying to, to show you the different phases, the different types of the work of God in our lives. And now we've come to this matter of clothing and being a, a change in our in our disposition has to do with uh, uh, some discipline. There's going to be discipline applied. There's going to be some chastising. And uh, Hebrews chapter 12 is all about that. Chastening. Uh, Let's look at Hebrews 12 and verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Chasteneth. And scourgeth. The meaning there, he lays the rod on. Every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening or accept it and are exercised by it, God deals with you as with a true son. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? But if you be without chastening, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards or illegitimate, your your strange children, your half your half uh, grown, half birthed and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily have for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Holiness comes after salvation, Holiness comes through chastening. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous or painful. Nevertheless, afterward, chastening, I remember when my dad used to get after me, I'd hide under the bed. (laughs) But he had a big, long strap. And he would get right down on his knees, and he'd reach in there and, and he'd just give it to me from both sides. And it was painful. I'll tell you what, it was painful. 
But you see, that puts something into me. And the, ch the child needs to know that you just can't go on and have your own way all the time. And so even in the Christian life, we have to learn, we, we can't go, go on and just do our own thing and have our own way and disregard the, the way of God and the commandments of God. Chastening, discipline, rebuke. That's what the word of God is for. Correction, instruction, rebuke that the child of God might be complete. Now watch what happens. No chastening for the present is joyous but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Now we have to make a differentiation. When you get saved, you are enabled to stand before God unashamed. Accept it. That's what's called imputed righteousness. Because when you get saved, you have now put your trust not in your own works or in your own righteousness, but you say, I stand in the righteousness of Christ Jesus my Lord. I accept him as my substitute. And God says, yes, come in, I accept you. That's the imputed righteousness. But you know that when you get saved, though there's a great turnaround, you're not totally changed. You're not totally delivered from all the, the bad things and the tendencies and uh, the ways of the flesh because the war goes on. The flesh lusts against the spirit, wars against the spirit. But there comes a time. There comes a time, folks, as you go through life and you respond to the discipline, you walk a walk of obedience. You walk circumspectly with your God. And as you do, over a period of time, righteousness grows in you. Do you see the term that's used in Hebrews 12? It's the fruit of righteousness. How many of you know it would not be consistent with nature for God to use the word fruit if it were something imparted instantaneously. Why? Because fruit takes time to grow. So righteousness, in the full sense of the word, that is you becoming an upright person, a person of integrity, honest in your dealings with men, that takes time to develop. And that is one of the great things that will characterize the bride when the Lord returns. The bride will have a robe of, of linen. And that linen stands for the righteousness of the saints. Righteousness which she has developed. Not which was given initially, but which she has developed. So that's an important point. And it's only, it's only as you and I allow the Lord to clothe us that we become clothed with his righteousness and his holiness, his character, his nature. And these, these verses from 11 to 13 have to do with the final work of the Holy Spirit to beautify us, to put the finishing touches on us, <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at verse, the last part of verse 10, I covered you with silk. That is something radiant and beautiful. I decked you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands, chain on your neck, put a jewel in your forehead, earrings in your ears, a beautiful crown upon your head. He is speaking of, of a woman that is being brought to a regal status, the status of a queen. Thou wast decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceedingly beautiful. That's what God's going to do with his church. He's going to make her exceedingly beautiful with the glory of God. And thou didst prosper 
into a kingdom. That's part of our vision. Israel grew into a kingdom. The church grows into a kingdom. Israel only grew into a kingdom when she was finished with all her murmuring, complaining, disobedience, lusting, idolatry, all that stuff in the wilderness, and then all that stuff in the book of Judges, anarchy, living to themselves. There's so much that has to, had to be dealt with. And finally, under the days of David and Solomon, Israel became a kingdom. They finally were listening to instruction from David and Solomon. They became an obedient people. They became a kingdom. And Solomon was allowed to build a, a wonderful temp temple, and God came down and dwelt fully in the midst of them. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is not when you're in the wilderness complaining every day and disobeying and giving God a hard time. That's not the kingdom yet. But the kingdom is when you have learned obedience, when you have finally submitted to his kingship, when you've received him as king, when he can come and dwell among you because the sanctuary is now clean, you become a kingdom. You only become a kingdom when you're under his authority fully. That's when you're a kingdom. And after you're a kingdom, he comes and dwells among you. And then the final step is verse 14, and thy renown or your glory went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. What a wonderful picture of what God wants to do with us and with the church, is to so work with us, to make impartation after impartation to our lives, even today as we're exposed to the word, there's impartation, there's cleansing of our hearts. I feel more yielded to the Lord at this point in, in, my ser in the service than when I come in. You are closer to being totally upright today than you were when you came in. It's here a little and there a little. God is finishing his new creation. We're becoming a kingdom. Jesus said to Israel, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruit thereof. That's the church. God's waiting for his kingdom to be established in our lives. And in our midst. What a wonderful picture this is. Where there is no vision, people wander. People just become undisciplined. People don't care. When there's no vision, anything goes. But where there's a vision, we walk the straight walk. We're thankful for our history. We realize we have some very real goals. Not only for our personal lives, but for all creation. Do you know today, but folks, all creation is waiting for you. All creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now we're doing it in part. Friday night in the hospital, little impartation, blessing, yes. We go about blessing people, doing good in a measure. But I'll tell you, there's something tremendous that God has scheduled for us up the road. And that's the coming of the Lord and bringing his church to the earth to establish his kingdom all over the earth. Glory to God. We have a future, a glorious future. Let's stand as David leads us in song. Glory to God.